a trio of books today, a trio of authors. They all are in the suspense thriller detective genres. Um, the title of this is Triple Threat, San Francisco, North Korea, and Hollywood. Um, so we have with us Jonathan Moore. And he's the author of Blood Relations. <clears throat> he's an Edgar Award nominated author of six novels. And Jonathan is a lawyer and he's uh, deep in meetings. So we're hoping that he will join us. Uh, and everyone's uh, aware that lawyers, of course, are sometimes uh, taken by contingencies. He's a litigator. So we'll next go to Gregory Shepard, going alphabetically. And Greg wrote um, a couple of thrillers, and I interviewed him a couple of years ago for a story on this literary scene in Hawaii and how to break in. And he came to me, I heard he'd landed a thriller with a publisher at the last second. And he made a very good example of someone who's uh, come through, broken through the wall. So it's great to see him here with his second book. Um, Greg spent his early years in New Jersey, London, that's London, England, New York City's Lower East Side and Honolulu. He lived in Japan four years studying Zen Buddhism at a temple in Kamakura. Sea of Fire is a culmination of travel to South Korea, as well as voluminous research on North Korea, which he described as an unimaginably bleak, brutal, sometimes quirky, and always a captivating place. So we're gonna let each writer um, start off and read a little bit, but I also wanted to introduce all three. So Penny Pence Smith is our third author. She's the author of The Last Leg Woman, a novel of Hollywood, murder, and gossip. Now, why do I pause between um, and and gossip? Because she is writing about a three-dot columnist, which if you know your journalism, if you read Herb Cain in the old days or the old celebrity journalists, there was always three dots between items. And um, Penny herself is a veteran of this field. We're gonna have a ball talking about Hollywood my book and, and my life really goes back to an old Hollywood that um, I can't say it doesn't exist anymore, but it's certainly not the main Hollywood we all think of. And um, I wrote this book basically as a recollection of the years that I spent as a leg woman, you mentioned that, and leg women sometimes and leg men often had almost as thrilling as an existence as the, the gossip columnists themselves. There was just, talk about peak performances for young people. And most of them were not young. I happened to be very lucky. I was 23 when I happened to, to fall into this amazing job. And I was one of those kids that came to Hollywood, you know, degree in hand in communication saying, I'll do anything, what do you need? But I like to write. And friends managed to put me together with a woman who was a movie magazine editor, and maybe I'll show my show and tell since it looks like we've got some time. This is one of our magazines. This happened to be the 1940s issue, but this was when I was there, it was in the, the late 1960s, movie mirror. It was one of seven. But the woman I worked with was also um, a, a small time weekly columnist who had great career advances and she was very fair and took me with her. So. We went from small weekly columns to, she replaced um, Sheila Graham on the United Feature Syndicate. By then I had my own byline features, my own question and answer columns all about Hollywood. And then we went from there, the whole package was taken into the New York Times. So I'm gonna um, just pause because everyone here also is, is thinking, okay, what about the novel? And I want to just say we have Bettina Grant, one of the stars of the field, and she dies. Yeah. And I'm just saying you must have experienced changeover and trauma and rivalry because your book is about the moment after the star of the field falls and then who's going to get her job. But <laughs> it becomes, it immediately takes on sinister overtones. Yes. And uh, so why don't you tell, bring, in, bring in Meredith Ogden, your character. I who is the leg woman? Meredith Ogden, Ogden is the leg woman, has been so for a decade with Bettina Grant, who is the, 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 uh, the, co the gossip columnist. And the purpose of this, or not the purpose, but I'd say the core of this was I used to think when I worked there, this gossip columnist had so much power and a huge presence. And I think, 
well, what would happen if she went away? I mean, what if she died or, or, or became incapacitated? It was a very, very competitive field in those days. I mean, people, it, it was amazing. So I always wondered about that. And I sat down and started writing the novel about that. What would happen if a gossip columnist of that ilk died and then was murdered because I, I love mystery. And what would happen to these people? And so that's sort of what, where this came from. And there's, you know, there's like three different tracks along here. There's the professional track. A column that's put out every week has to keep going. It doesn't just go away. And so somebody's got to keep that going. The second thing is the personal thing. Well, who's going to take this over? I mean, a lot of people that would love to be this, step into this role. Can you imagine being the top columnist in the, basically the world, but the country with the New York Times label on you? And, and then, of course, there's the other underpersonal side of the individual characters themselves. What does it mean to them? And so Meredith Ogden became my, you know, my, my front piece. And, uh, um, and then from there, it was an awful lot of fun because, of course, nobody murdered the columnist that I worked for. <laughs> and, and I can't say I ever worked for anybody who murdered. So you just got away with it. <laughs> Somebody did. <laughs> No, that's true. But that was the core of the book. And, uh, and, and the other thing I wanted to do was to really show readers what it was like to be a journalist, not, not a confidant to the stars, but a journalist in those days. And it was, it was an incredibly interesting world. But again, we had a column to fill every day. It wasn't like, well, we don't have anything today, so we'll do something. To no. Every single day, we had three pages that had to go to New York. And uh, so filling that was a very big job, even when it wasn't all that glamorous. <laughs> this is Sea of Fire, his second novel. And uh, like I said, Greg and I had a good talk a couple of years ago for the article, The Writer's Life, which is about what it's like to make it as a writer in Hawaii. I think I interviewed about 24 people, maybe more. Um, so thank you for talking to me then. And um, it's great to have you here. So you have a tremendous amount a really interesting background for this book about a place unlike Penny who lives it. You, you can't say you lived in North Korea. No, I can't. Uh, yeah, so I'm gonna read your first line and then let you do what you like to do and then we'll, uh, we'll bring up some interesting questions. Okay, chapter one, Sea of Fire, Korean Peninsula, February 15. Raise your hand if you would like to die today. The tour bus, the tour guide on the bus to the DMZ now had the complete attention of his passengers. Okay, that's pretty much a perfect opener. You have the complete attention of everyone, all the readers. Um, go ahead and take the floor. Okay, well, going back to something you said, uh, I have not lived in North Korea, but I tell you, I have a recurring dream where I'm sort of on the edge of uh, maybe Kapahulu in Honolulu. And if I turn the corner, I will be in Pyongyang. It's one of those kinds of things. And it's a, it's a, a paradise, uh, North Korea is, uh, on first glance. And then I walk further down and I see all sorts of horrible things. So that, that's kind of uh, encapsulating, uh, I, I suppose, the fascination I've always had with North Korea and uh, places like that, which are off limits. Uh, Albania was another one I was always fascinated by because you couldn't go in there for so long. And when mm -hmm. I was a kid, I'd uh, look at National Geographic's on Albania. <laughs> so, uh, strange kid. Uh, anyway, I have that interest in North Korea. And about 10 years ago, I had a, a sabbatical and I finished the sabbatical project quickly. I uh, teach music and theater at Kauai Community College. And I finished the uh, sabbatical project. I got that out of the way and fulfilled my obligation. And I thought, well, what am I going to do now? And I thought, well, I've always wanted to write a novel. It's the bucket list kind of thing. So I decided to write what I am interested in. And that was North Korea. And I love spy uh, thrillers. So I put it on Kindle for a while and you know, self-promoted, which uh, feels very uh, demeaning. It's kind of like uh, you know, selling raffle tickets or something like that. You know? uh, but then I, I tried again, I, I did some more editing of it and I thought, well, you know, this is not bad. 
So I found an agent in New York who's terrific. And I sent out, uh, I went to agentquery.com and I uh, crafted this, uh, this email, uh, which started off with, uh, I am writing to you as a former smuggler of contraband into South Korea, but more about that later. <laughs> and then I got into uh, the rest of uh, what the novel was about. And then at the end, I explained what that meant. I lived in Japan, as Don pointed out, and my brother and I, he also lived in Japan for many years, uh, we would work with this uh, South Korean uh, democracy project during the time of martial law in the 80s. And uh, so we would uh, smuggle uh, democracy literature into South Korea uh, in high hopes that they would not be able to, uh, the customs people wouldn't be able to read English, or at least to the degree of, uh, of uh, you know, stopping us. And uh, we would bring it to a place in Seoul, a Catholic church in Seoul, which was involved in um, human rights and, and democracy in South Korea uh, and getting rid of martial law. So that was my first entry into Korea, the Korean Peninsula. And then just fr through conversations with the people there, uh, heard about North Korea and how horrible it is. It's only 26 miles away. I was a marathon runner at the time, 26 miles, that's not far at all. And so it, it just piqued my interest and stayed with me for the longest time until 10 years ago when I had the, uh, the opportunity to, to write something. So in order to, to find it, as I didn't live in North Korea, but I feel as if I have, uh, the recurring dreams are maybe an indication of uh, the depth of that. But I read everything there is practically uh, about North Korea, uh, watched all sorts of videos on YouTube for, oh, they eat this way. And ah, what is that called there, that dish? Just for some you know detail, technical detail uh, to make it a little bit more uh, real to life. And so um, I sent the uh, email out and to several hundred agents and got one reply. <laughs> and <laughs> that one reply turns out to be uh, the best person I could have uh, made contact with. And she, she's the one who got me the, uh, the contract. For this. Now, when you say you sent out several hundred emails, was it a mass email or one at a time? And, uh, one at a time. Like, no, I guess it was one at a time. I can't remember. It was 10 years ago, Don. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm sure it was one at a time because it would have been like spam, right? Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think I think as all writers want to make sure they don't make a fatal error. Like that's so right. Is, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's a good tip there. Um, it's called what's it called? Query.com? Query uh agentquery.com. One word agent Okay. Query. Remember that folks out there. Um yeah, so I mean, and you speak Japanese, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I live. And the Japanese have a very dicey, uh, intense, and even genetic relationship with Korea. Yeah. Um, although they don't like to admit it. Um, and my wife is half Korean, by the way. So, uh, so I think what really uh, got me though is it's sort of the ultimate challenge to write about a closed society. And you say you did all this research, but how do you project yourself? and your character, Patrick Featherstone, who's a, I should say to the, to our viewers, he gets hauled out of self-imposed retirement to try to prevent or neutralize a defector who happens to, uh, they know each other very well and have some history. So, you know, Patrick has to slip into North Korea, not willingly at first. So how do you put yourself though in, in walking through the streets of Korea and navigating, uh, defection and uh, espionage in a place where, I mean, I remember that poor kid from Ohio who brought, who took a poster and they, you know, they have a way of beating you yeah. that doesn't leave any bruises, but destroys all your organs. I mean, it's such a ferocious place. Yeah. Um, so how, how did you do that projection? Well, I mean, I, I watched a lot of videos and I got a sense of what it looks like there, uh, what the layout of the city is, Pyongyang. And, uh, there's a very, there's a furtive quality to uh, the, the people uh, by necessity because they're always looking over their shoulders because they're always being watched. Uh, so I tried to inject some of that. And in terms of the, uh, the meetup places for, for example, Patrick and the guy you mentioned, Tyler Kang, who they were sniper uh, partners. 
and uh, Patrick accidentally shot a kid in Serbia. And uh, he blames Tyler for that. So they're, they've become blood enemies, uh, the backstory of it. And they, he has to go find him, uh, find Tyler, and if necessary, to kill him. Bef because uh, Tyler has ostensibly defected to North Korea. He's uh, of Korean ancestry. And he's an aeronautical engineer. And he's got uh, missile secrets. And that's kind of like his... his uh, a card of entry saying uh, to to uh, North Korea saying I've got something you need and uh, it turns out that the stuff that he has uh, he, he's a fake defector uh, maybe I shouldn't have given that away but uh, they he and Patrick uh, by necessity team up and they have to stop uh, a nuclear uh, uh, attack on South Korea which is being um, planned uh, by an evil character named, who is simply referred to as Comrade Moon. He is the head of Bureau 39, which is an actual organization or a, a bureau in the North Korean government charged with uh, bringing in um, hard cash uh, through drug smuggling, all sorts of horrible things. And uh, so they're up against Comrade Moon. Um, and the places where they meet, I had to make up out of whole cloth, uh, but mm -hmm. not, not totally whole cloth. There are, for example, one of the places they meet is a bar in the Corio Hotel, which actually exists. Uh, and I've never been there. Uh, I don't think I ever want to go to North Korea, especially now. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's imaginative, um, it's, but I tried to make it as real to life as I could based on what I've read. And uh, I have to give kudos uh, to a guy named Bradley Martin, who wrote a book called um, Under, the, Under the Loving Care of the Fatherly Leader. And it's about 700 pages long. It's got just like everything you would want to know about North Korea. It's, it's just a treasure trove, plus all sorts of other books by defectors. So the defector accounts give a lot of information as to what goes on for example, in the, uh, the concentration camps, because uh, some of the action uh, takes place there. And so Penny, uh, you're, Mer you're Meredith. Uh, what I like about her is she's in this, having to do her job, trying to take over um, and, and fighting off a rival uh, who also wants to take over the big chair in the middle of a murder investigation, sleeping with the detectives. She has someone else she's sleeping with. And, you know, there's a house man who's behaving oddly and she keeps, you know, they keep saying the detective says, now go home and don't move. And of course she doesn't. And she, and then she gets whacked and, uh, or locked in a closet and whacked and, or, you know, so the thing is though, is that it isn't like she's, you know, a dumb blonde. No, she's thinking, I know I'm doing what they shouldn't be doing. And I know that this is scary, but to hell with it. I've got a story to write. And, um, I have to hand it to you because I mean, how else would stories get written? Well, you know, ironically, we've had this conversation, a friend of mine this week, I'm working on my sequel and we're talking about a similar kind of situation. She says, I just don't like to see women get beat. And I said, well, I don't either, but you know, I, I stuff happens when you're covering a story. Sometimes you fall down, sometimes you get hit. You know, there's just a lot of stuff that happens. And sometimes it's a woman that happens, it happens to. And uh, so I put it out to a couple of girlfriends. I said, okay, what should I do here? You know, should I make this just an all think thing or should I make this, you know? And it was funny. Oh, you just give them hell. <laughs> just give them hell. You know? So anyway, you're absolutely right, Don, on that one. It, it really is about covering a story. I have to say that I've had some interesting situations um, I have not been hit, but on the other hand, there are journalists who have been, and some of these situations lend themselves today. Heaven knows what could happen. You know, in 1983, it was a little different, but um, it's, a, it's a really good question and, and very pertinent to what I'm working on. <laughs> mm -hmm. So uh, what you're working on, uh, do you have another book that you're thinking of doing? Oh, I'm, I finished yesterday the first draft of the sequel to, the, to Leg Woman. And oh. uh, 
So, yeah, well, I didn't intend to do that, but you know, you kind of get into your characters and the next thing you know is, well, the story's over, but there's still a lot more to be told and these characters have become alive. And I had a lot of people who wrote me and said, well, what happens next? You know, I mean, we've solved this issue, but what's the next thing that's gonna happen? So, I, oh, well, okay, that'll be fun. So I jumped in and, and uh, now I have to deal with the marketing aspect of it, but I haven't finished well, it yet. So we're still yeah, dealing yeah. with who gets beat up. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm really impressed. And I know Greg, you're working on sequels. Yeah, I've got one coming out in February. Um, it's called Rings of Fire. And I wrote it uh, about two, two years ago. Uh, and it was originally going to be set at the Tokyo Olympics 2020. Well, guess what? Uh, that's, that's, <laughs> that had to be changed. So I had to go back to the manuscript and uh, re-jigger uh, it so that it's now the Tokyo 2021 Olympics. And there's uh, the American president uh, gets, uh, the election is, is put off too, uh, all because of COVID. Uh, but anyway, the, the sequel is set at the Tokyo Olympics whenever it may be, uh, but it is fiction. So I hope people will give some leeway on that. And it's, uh, it has to do with terrorism. Uh, the end of Sea of Fire, uh, there is a cataclysmic uh, revolution and the Kim family is deposed. Uh, but there are all sorts of uh, young, there's, they're called the Bong Wan Zhou, and they are the, uh, the princelings uh, of North Korea. And they uh, are now out of their, their little privileged life. And they are, are being led by a guy who wants to restore the Kim family. And he's going to dis disrupt the Tokyo Olympics to uh, drive his point home and hopefully uh, uh, accomplish his goals uh, that way. And I would say for Greg, the one thing that I didn't mention is, you know, we, we talked about violence and spy stuff, but there's a strong undercurrent of spiritualism because Patrick starts off the book in a monastery. He's trying to be a monk. And uh, so tell us about how Zen Buddhism informed your work. Well, as, I, as you mentioned earlier, I studied Zen Buddhism in Japan and at a monastery, or not a monastery, a temple over there for a number of years. And uh, I, I, when I first started to write the book, I wanted the character to have a, a deep conflict. Well, there's a deep conflict between uh, shooting people with uh, an M14 and, and uh, having a vow of uh, nonviolence. So he took a vow of nonviolence after he accidentally shot the kid in, uh, in Serbia, comes back to Kamakura. He was born and raised in Kamakura. He's American. His mother is uh, from Kauai though. And uh, so he's one fourth Japanese uh, ancestry. And so he comes back to, to Japan uh, after he is uh, clandestinely court-martialed. They can't let this out because there are details about the shooting in Serbia that would tip the hand that the CIA was involved in uh, getting rid of, uh, of uh, evil people. Uh, not that I have any problem with that, but uh, he comes back to Japan and the only thing that rids his mind of the image of the, the, the shot kid uh, is uh, meditation. And he goes to this uh, particular temple in Kamakura, which is totally fictional. And he studies with the Zen master who kind of nurses him back to psychological health uh, to the point where now Patrick is like saying bye-bye to all that. And uh, he wants to be a monk and just live a life of co uh, contemplative meditation and very simply. And he's having a nice time with that. Well, in come, into his life comes this whole thing with his uh, former sniper buddy, Tyler Kang, and also his uh, former fiance, there's a connection uh, there too, uh, is, is kidnapped uh, and abducted to North Korea, which is not, un, not well, it's not uncommon, but it happens. A lot of uh, Japanese have been abducted and brought to North Korea to be uh, language teachers, uh, whether they like it or not. And uh, she's, she's kidnapped because her father has stolen something. Uh, and uh, so there's, there's this kind of louche, lurid uh, underworld in Japan uh, centering around the pachinko parlors, those, uh, those 
pinball like machines. And so, but anyway, he's, he's having, he's living this very placid, uh, serene life uh, at the temple and uh, into his life comes this crazy uh, situation. And he has to make a choice at a certain point. He's got this vow of nonviolence, but what do you do? You know, somebody's gonna kill lots of people. Would you let him go? So it's the classic example of if you could have hit, uh, killed Hitler, would you have pulled the trigger? Same thing here, except it's Comrade Boom. Right, and uh, you know, well, we'll just leave it there because there's too many examples in the world. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I'd like to say thanks very much to our two local authors who've written very good books. And, you know, it's sad that we couldn't get Jonathan Moore here. I suspect he was in litigation. I know he's a very busy guy. Um, here's his book, Blood Relation. Um, he's written a lot of books that started off as one kind of genre and become horror. And this is a, a new series that he started that is more of a straight up detective novel. And the horror is sort of modern life as we're experiencing it right now. And it's about gene splicing among other things. It's set in San Francisco and Northern California. It's really, really good on locale, sort of like Dashiell Hammett was, um, you know, the old San Francisco that we all wanna have come back. And I'll just read his first line. The first time I saw Claire Gravesend, she was already dead. And with that, uh, Roger, thank you very much. Thanks to the Hawaii Book and Music Festival. Um, this has really been a thrill and take care.